So, like I said, these local functions, they're uh, solutions to, uh, to an atomic problem uh, represented on, on radial logarithmic grids, and there's a pseudization procedure to compute out of these all electron partial waves, pseudized partial waves, and a pseudized local potential, and then there's procedures to construct these, um, these projector functions. And the only real requirement is that they're dual to the uh, pseudized partial waves. And in, this, um, in, in these quantities, we can rewrite um, our uh, cohn sham equation in such a way. So uh, we, before, so that is the, oops, so sorry. That is the counterpart to this particular equation, the all, all electron atomic problem in terms of these pseudized quantities uh, one can write uh, this particular equation uh, where we have, uh, so you, now you see these projectors popping up. The solutions to this equation are now not, not the all electron partial waves, but the pseudized partial waves. Um, and we see a few additional quantities emerging, and th those are these uh, Dij, um, Dij matrices, and Qij, and, they, and those are the so called. Uh, a PAW strength parameters and uh, augmentation charges. So the augmentation charges, they account for the fact that the norm that is carried by these pseudized partial waves is not necessarily equal to the norm uh, of the all electron partial waves and these strength parameters are these particular expectation values um, of the uh, the difference between these expectation values in the all electron partial wave basis and in the pseudo partial wave basis, and this particular equation yields the same uh, eigenvalue spectrum as the uh, all electron problem. Yeah. So, um, and in terms of uh, of electronic scattering, uh, one usually represents that in the following way. So, so these equations should have an identical eigenvalue, eigenvalue spectrum. And in scattering theory, we then look at uh, what is called the logarithmic derivative. Those are these quantities. Uh, and they should be uh, essentially the same over a whole range uh, of these energies. And then we have a good pseudo, then we have generated a good pseudo potential. So this is a, 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 well, not a very modern uh, pseudo-potential theory. And there we see the solid lines, they, are the, they represent um, the um, logarithmic derivatives for the, for the all electron problem. Uh, and the dotted lines uh, are the logarithmic derivatives for the, for the pseudized version uh, of that particular equation uh, for this pseudo-potential method, the Trouillet martins pseudo-potentials. And we see a large deviations when we move away from the valence uh, part of the eigenenergy spectrum. Whereas the PAW represents these, uh, these scattering properties uh, over a much larger energy range. And that is normally indicative for uh, transferability. Huh? Because with these Trouillet Martin's uh, pseudo potentials, you will be able to, re to uh, represent the atomic problem almost exactly. It will have the same uh, eigenvalues in the pseudo-potential description and, uh, as, in the, uh, as in the all electron one. But as soon as you put that into a chemical environment, the fact that you do not represent scattering properties as truly um, will start to show up. And the PRW method, because of the fact that scattering properties are reproduced over such a large uh, energy range, um, uh, will help uh, in terms of transferability. Yes. So what do these functions look like, for instance, the PAW method? So we include, for each, uh, for each valence channel, we uh, include uh, two functions uh, in the standard potentials, where we choose one of the eigenenergies at the bound state uh, of, the of the atomic valence, and, and then one of them at the non-bound state. Yeah, so that, that means that we have additional uh, degrees of freedom in our in our local basis. So the, the use of the frozen core approximation is also at the level of this PAW, right? So we, uh, there's a whole bunch of electrons that are only present implicitly by, by their core charge density. So 
that is added to all terms, to the exchange correlation terms and, and the Hartree uh, term as well. Um, yes. So, um, and th this, is, this is maybe a point that is nice to make. We had it uh, in a conversation at the coffee break, it already came up. So in the PAW method, our, uh, in terms of our local functions, uh, we can express the charge density in such a way. Uh, inside of the PAW spheres, we can do the same uh, in terms of the, um, of the pseudized uh, partial waves. And those particular densities are then used to represent the local potential uh, on these radial grids. And that is, that is where, where, for instance, the PAW method differs from ultrasoft pseudopotentials. Because ultrasoft pseudopotentials in computing, uh, we compute these, these strength parameters. In ultrasoft pseudopotential method, you would use the atomic density for these two terms. In the PAW method, you use the actual density. Uh, decomposed in these, um, in these partial waves inside of the, of the strength parameters. So there, there's one, uh, and that is from a computational point of view, it's not a, a huge effort, but it's an additional effort that we have to update these potentials and these strength parameters in every step where the density changes that you would not do in an ultrasoft pseudo potential. Yes. So, Three contributions, like we said. One plane wave, so that lives in, in the whole cell, right? These plane waves extend over the whole simulation box. Then there's a part that we subtract that uh, inside of the PAW spheres, uh, in terms of these pseudized partial waves, and the part that we add to it in terms of these all electron partial waves inside of these PAW spheres. And how much of those things are admixed to our plane wave solution is given by this particular projection. And, the, um, and this particular decomposition of, uh, uh, of the wave function in three parts, uh, in, in a pseudo plane wave part, a pseudized, um, a pseudized radial part, and an all electron radial part, this sort of carries over to all the quantities that, that we uh, that we will compute. So not only orbitals, but also densities and energies will decompose in these uh, kind of contributions. And that is written here for the kinetic energy, for instance. So this is an expression that we already saw before. And now we substitute our, uh, for, the, for the old electron wave function, we substitute uh, our POW approximation. And, then we, and there we assume then completeness in these local bases, and that is always only approximately given. But for, uh, for this decomposition, we assume this to be complete. And then we end up, uh, for, this, for this kinetic energy, we'll end up with three contributions, of which one is purely plane wave nature. One involves only these partial waves, these pseudized partial waves, and one contribution uh, involves only these um, all electron partial waves. And this is a very essential thing. Because if this wouldn't, wouldn't separate in these three contributions, if at any point, uh, if at any point I would have here, for instance, a plane wave uh, object, <coughs> object and here one a radial function, then the method would be gone. Yeah, because that would mean that to evaluate such an element where one side lives on the plane wave grid and one side lives on radial grids, I would have to bring them onto a common grid. And then I'm dead. Because that would either mean that I would have to, to, uh, to take all these uh, fine features that are easily representable on, an, on a radial grid and put them on a plane wave grid, prohibitively expensive, not possible. Or I would have to throw away uh, everything that lives on the radial grid. Uh, and then the, sort of, uh, the, the child is gone with the bathwater, right? So, the, 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 so, so this, this whole PAW method li lives from the fact that all contributions can be separated in three, con in three terms where uh, there's never any admixture of something that lives on the plane wave grid and something that lives on the radial grid. The only connection, and that is here given by this, what is called one center occupancies, the only connection between the two grids is the projection of this plane wave function onto these projection operators. And there we have so much choice of freedom in these projection operators because they only have to be dual to these 
uh, to these guys that we can choose them of a form that is easily representable on, in plane waves. So that is, that is why, why the POW method actually works. So actually, this is a, a bit more general. Any semi-local operator can be um, shown to be uh, written in this form. So, any, so if you have a, a, a semi-local operator A that acts, that acts on the true uh, orbital, the PAW method, uh, through the constructions that, that I showed you before and through this assumption of completeness, the PAW method associates a pseudo-operator of this particular shape that acts on these pseudized um, um, orbitals on the plane wave part of the, of the um, that acts on the plane wave part of the PAW wave function. Uh, so this um, expectation value <coughs> and this one are exactly the same. And this plane and the plane wave part of this uh, of this um, all electron wave function is actually the, the variational part. So that's the part that our computation tries to compute, right? That, that WASP tries to compute. Because you see these guys, uh, these ones and these ones, and the projectors, they are given, they're computed, pre-computed and, and, and specified on the Podcar file. The only thing that remains to be determined is this plane wave part. So that's the variational part. So that is, that is here, what, there's another example of this uh, for the density operator. You see that it separates again into three of these terms, um, a plane wave part of the density, uh, a, one, a part expressed in, in pseudized partial waves, and one expressed in uh, all electron partial waves, where the last two, the last two uh, live only inside of these uh, PAW grids on, on um, uh, in the PAW spheres on uh, logarithmic uh, radial grids. So non-local operators are a bit more complicated and I won't, get, uh, I won't go in, into the details. The thing is that uh, what is done there, there's, a, there's an additional trick uh, employed there so that we can, uh, can separate um, expectation value of a non-local operator again into these three parts. Uh, because what is non-local in, in the, the, the first non-local thing that we have is already the, the, the Hartree uh, potential, right? Because it doesn't depend only on, on the position, but it depends on R and R prime. So in that sense, it's non-local. And what is done there to, uh, to achieve again this, uh, this, this separation in three terms is that on the plane wave grid, inside of the PAW spheres, uh, there are um, soft uh, compensation charges added inside of these spheres. And these soft charges, they restore uh, all the um, correct moments of the charge density inside of the sphere. So not only the norm, but also the first and the second moment and, and what have you not, uh, is restored so that, um, the, uh, so that the potential that is cast outside of this um, outside of this sphere by the density inside the sphere is the correct one. Uh, because if you have the moments inside of the sphere correct, then the potential outside will be the true one. Yeah, so that is done. Um, and these soft compensation charges, why is it soft? Well, soft in the sense that they have to be representable in terms of plane waves. Yeah, so, uh, so that means that the interstitial, the potential in the interstitial is correct by adding these charges. Uh, and then the fact that we have messed with this charge density is then compensated by the fact that we add these, uh, these compensation charges on the radial grids as well, uh, where they are uh, subtracted out, right? So we have the long range interactions between, uh, between uh, charge density is corrected on the plane wave grid, and the fact that we have messed with this pseudized charge density is corrected on one of the radial grids. And then again, uh, for, for instance, in the Hartree energy, this uh, means that we again separate the energy contributions into a part that is evaluated completely on the plane wave grid and two parts that are evaluated on, on the radial grids. So in that sense, you can, uh, for non-local operators with, with, these, with these tricks, with compensation charges, you can uh, make sure that you can um, 
that again we can decompose it in these three uh, contributions where there's no crosstalk between uh, plane wave grids, between the regular grid and the radial grids. Yeah. So, in, in, in that sense, uh, our total energy actually uh, decomposes into three contributions. Um, eh? So we saw that for the, for the local operators and for the non-local operators. And so in total, we have a part of our total energy on the plane wave grid and two parts uh, stemming from the radial grids inside of our PAW spheres. Right. So, and here, the, well, this is a point that I've already made a few uh, times. So what is good? What is good is that we, uh, and that is what you saw, so the strength of the PW method is in the, li lies in the fact that we have, um, well, that we represent the scattering properties of the atomic problem over a wide range, so they're highly transferable. Another strength is that, um, that due to the fact that we, uh, that we have these, these local functions, the atomic ones, and that we, we uh, that we make this reconstruction of the nodal features, so we implicitly work with the with the complete uh, uh, one electron uh, with the complete all electron function uh, means that we remain orthogonal to the core. Uh, so many other pseudo-potential methods suffer from the fact that that you uh, that you have uh, a certain amount of non-orthogonality. Uh, to the frozen core states. That is not uh, happening in, in the PAW method. Uh, so that's two things. Uh, high transferability and orthogonality between core and valence state uh, is, uh, is sort of guaranteed. Yeah. So, and the essence is that we never uh, put quantities on one common grid. So we never try to put radial functions onto the plane wave grid uh, or vice versa. Otherwise the methods would immediately break down. We get a lot of uh, questions because, and, and I can understand this, that people would like to visualize the wave function, say, but can I not visualize the, the PAW wave function? And they say, no, actually you cannot. Be because of the fact that the PAW method works, you cannot visualize the wave function. Because to visualize it would mean to bring everything on a common grid. I would like to reconstruct this wave function that's never explicitly done. Yeah, so this is what we saw here. This object is never explicitly calculated. If there would be a need to do that, then the whole method, you could throw it away. Then you could, yeah, then you could work with the common grid immediately. Yeah. So. OK. So the pseudo orbitals are the variational uh, quantities, uh, these plane wave pseudo, pseudo parts, th those are the variational quantities. Uh, this is just a recast of the, of the previous equation, where now, uh, by the way, you see here, uh, before here we had these pseudized partial waves, but actually, obviously, in real life, we're not trying to repre represent those uh, particular ones, but uh, we want to uh, um, compute the, um, the plane wave part of our, of our uh, PAW wave function. So that's the actual equation. Uh, the charge density used in these strength parameters is the actual one, so not the atomic one. In that sense, it's different from ultra-soft pseudo-potential theory, and those are the representations of these, uh, of these charge densities inside of the spheres. So is it accurate? Yes, it is very accurate. So this is a recent publication where uh, a lot of uh, Work has been put in uh, in comparing the accuracy of PAW potential sets with all electron calculations, sort of benchmark them. And uh, yeah, if you're interested, there it is by by Kurtle Jagere and it's published in, published in, in, in Science uh, some time ago. Um, and essentially, what they, they what they compute is a measure. So this is the volume versus energy curves. Uh, of, of one code, let's say our code or, or any other PAW code, and, and, a, and an all electron code, and the area, uh, the area where they're different is computed in terms of energy, and this, this is the measure of, of the, of the uh, average deviation you would find for elemental 
uh, elemental solids of all these elements, and that is truly, truly tiny. Uh, actually, for a long time, the hardest part was uh, for the all electron methods to agree on a common value and not for the PAW codes. So that was a nice detail. Uh, so the, the, so they, they are the, the individual contributions to this average value. So for instance, for boron, uh, the delta, so, the, so this area uh, in the difference between these two curves is 0 0.2 milli electron volt. If you compare it's the calculus. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, yes, well, Europeans like to use commas sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> It means the same thing. <laughs> yes, I uh, know I got this picture from Kurt and he, so he for some reason, you, I think it's standard in some programs, it's standard. Uh, if you use Open <coughs> Office or, 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 or Microsoft Office in, in the European version, you would have to go through, I don't know how many menus uh, to find a, a point where you can change this actually. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, this is 0 0.2, uh, yeah. So this is a comparison uh, against, uh, already spoke about this before, against the Gaussian, uh, Gaussian basis set calculations, so this GTOs, Gaussian loop orbitals. Yeah, anyway, for the G2 test set, so it's a, it's a set of small, small molecules, and this is done, this was actually work where we are benchmarking our hybrid functional code. So this is for PBE and for PBE zero. It's the, the difference between a uh, Gaussian uh, calculation and a PAW calculation. And it's in almost all cases, it's smaller than one kcal per mole, uh, the energy differences of these atomization energies of these, uh, of these small molecules. And one kcal per mole, that's something that will pop up uh, at, at several occasions. That is what is commonly called chemical accuracy. So any method that reaches this, is the winner. And uh, of course, we, with respect to experiment, right? <laughs> uh, because that is sort of the accuracy that they can reach in experiment. And that would mean if your method <coughs> guarantees this, you, you wouldn't need to do the experiment anymore. Uh, this is, of course, um, agreement of two uh, DFT calculations, right? So this, this is not close to experiment, but they agree amongst each other at least. So let's. Um, Yes, let's do this. Electronic minimization. So we have spoken about the fact that, so here, uh, unfortunately, I think I've left out the fact that we work on pseudo orbitals. So let's forget PAW formalism for a while, right? So these are the orbitals that we want to uh, determine. And we said, uh, okay, so we have to solve these cohen sham equations. And there's essentially two ways that, uh, that one can do this. Um, so one is direct minimization. So we could uh, start with a set of trial orbitals and, uh, and minimize the total energy by following the, orbit, the, the gradient on the orbitals in the direction of decreasing total energy. And uh, the gradient on the orbitals is actually something like this. Yeah, so this is the action of the Hamiltonian on, on the current orbital uh, minus uh, its, its current uh, approximate eigenvalue. Uh, this is what you call the gradient. It's also sometimes also called the residual. We saw this before. Yeah? So, uh, and at mixing uh, uh, parts of this to the current orbitals means that you can, well, you can use conjugate gradient or, or any, any direct uh, minimization method to follow this to, uh, to, the <coughs> to a local minimum in the total energy. So that is, uh, uh, for instance, done in Carparinello. Um, the thing that we commonly do uh, is, uh, is called the, so is the self consistency cycle. Uh, and that's slightly different. We don't start per se with the trial orbitals, but you can start with a trial density. And then you um, construct the Hamiltonian in accordance with this density. And then, uh, well, um, essentially diagonalize it, so solve this particular equation, and that will give you a new set of orbitals and a, and a new density, and then you mix this 
new density with the old one and that defines a new Hamiltonian that you again diagonalize. And so that's just different. Here you work directly on the orbitals. Here we do a diagonalization and work with the density. And that's uh, the self-consistency cycle. And that is actually, uh, well, that was shown to be uh, a bit more efficient um, than the uh, direct optimization, especially uh, if you go to, uh, to um, metallic systems. So and that's a comparison that is shown here. So here we have uh, convergence in the total energy uh, in the self-consistency cycle. And here we have it for several different system sizes at a sort of longish uh, disordered diamond cells. For, for different sizes, we have it here in the direct method. Um, if you then go to a metallic system, you see that uh, that self-consistency cycle still manages to converge in, um, in a reasonable number of iterations. But if this becomes larger, this cell in a certain direction, then uh, this direct minimization will have huge troubles finding uh, the ground state. So we tend to rely on, on this self-consistency <coughs> cycle and charge density mixing. Uh, the problem with, with, this, uh, uh, with this situation, especially with this situation in, uh, in the direct method, uh, is called charge sloshing. And that is something uh, that, is, uh, that I've tried to explain here. So the gradient, we can, uh, we can decompose in two parts. Uh, the gradient we saw before, we can compose it in a part, uh, um, in the gradient part that lives in the subspace that is spent by our current orbitals. Uh, that is uh, this part, so, which is often called the subspace rotational part. And there's a part of the gradient that points outside of the space that is spent by our current orbitals. And that is this part. And it's actually this, this part where, uh, of the gradient that lives inside of the subspace um, that, that is spanned by the orbitals that poses the problem uh, in direct minimization. Um, and that is because of, well, what you see here, this is a Hamiltonian a matrix element between two states that we currently have. And this is their occupation. Huh? So this part exists only if uh, parts of our states are uh, so only between uh, parts of the spectrum of unoccupied states and occupied states, right? So it's a rotation <coughs> between uh, an admixture of unoccupied to uh, occupied states. That is part of the gradient. So considering two states uh, very close together, uh, and that is what you would have in a metal or in a small gap system, uh, if you have two states that are very close together, uh, then uh, a small subspace rotation will admix well, parts of one to the other and vice versa. And if you look at what that means um, for the change in the density, uh, so we suppose that these states are essentially uh, plane wave-like, and uh, they're representable in this way. If we then look at what that means for, for a small gradient, that means that we have a gradient is of this form. And the change of the, of the potential due to this is um, inversely um, uh, proportional to the square of this small difference that we have in, in our, in our, um, in our uh, wave vector. So as we have a small difference between this one and this one, the, uh, the um, admixture of these states uh, with each other yields, uh, yields a huge response in the, in the potential, um, in the electrostatic part of the potential. Um, that is something that, that often pops up. We, we try to uh, counter this with, with clever mixing of the charge densities. That is why sometimes your systems will not converge, because you have this charge lossing. Very small, long wavelength uh, changes in your charge density huge, uh, yield huge responses in your potential, and your iterations will become um, uh, unstable. Uh, because the, 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 the largest stable step that you could take would be uh, connected to the, uh, so, so this, uh, this change in the, in the wave vector is connected to the size of the cell. That is why uh, the small, so this is like a particle in the box. And it's connected to the inverse of the, of the length in your cell. So if you have, for instance, and maybe you have noticed this, if you have a system uh, 
that is long in one direction, it's harder to converge it uh, than, than if it would not be. And that's because of, because of these effects. So uh, if you have a surface that is long in a certain direction, uh, because you have this vacuum, this would possibly immediately pop up. Um, yes, so, uh, so the, the smallest stable step size that you would have here would be inversely proportional to the, to the square of the, of the longest size of your cell in terms of charge sloshing. If you have a large, uh, if you have a large gap, that doesn't hurt you uh, so much because then this will be very, very small. Uh, but smaller gap systems will be uh, strongly affected by this. So what we do to counter this, or what, what, the self what in the self-consistency cycle counters this, is the fact that um, how we set up a Hamiltonian for a certain density and we compute these wave functions. Well, I've written here iterative refinement of the wave functions and come back to this. Uh, but essentially, we do a diagonalization and that yields us wave functions that yield a new charge density. If I would use this new charge density um, uh, in its totality, then charge sloshing might, might kick in immediately. But that we don't do. Instead, one admixes it only partly to the previous charge density. And it should dampen out these uh, effects of charge sloshing. Uh, so a clever mixer will, will be able to dampen out these effects. And this mixing will give a new charge density, and this whole thing uh, is taken for another, for another spin. So, um, so two things uh, that are important. One is iterative diagonalization, because we said before we diagonalize this Hamiltonian, but we don't want to di diagonalize it exactly. Uh, come back to this, but we do this iteratively. Um, and, uh, and another thing that another key point is density mixing to keep effects like charge sloshing under, under control. Yes? When you start the self consistency cycle, we have to give a trial density charge. That how, 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 do we, how do we give that, like the trial first one? The first one is, uh, is uh, commonly constructed from uh, the atomic charges. So the atomic charge density is also information that is carried on the Podcar file. And the program will take all the atomic positions and put atomic charge densities on the respective positions. And that will be, be your initial charge density. So that is the standard behavior. You don't have to do anything uh, for, for that. And that is, that is quite a good. Uh, common choice. Um, if you then look at what happens in the program, um, so if you start from scratch, if you don't have wave functions from a previous calculation that you can use to restart, uh, then, the thing, then it will start from atomic charge densities. And uh, there will be a few steps where the charge density is kept fixed. So depending on the algor algorithm you use, the first few steps uh, the charge density, in the first five or ten steps, the charge density is kept fixed because the wave functions that you use, they are initialized with random numbers. Uh, so they might be pretty bad because we do this iterative refinement of the wave function. So we, we do not exactly diagonalize the Hamiltonian only uh, on its way. The wave functions are, 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 are improved. Uh, but starting from random numbers, the, the charge density you would get out of this first step eh, would be really, really bad. So you don't want to mix that to something that is pretty reasonable, because atomic charges are pretty reasonable. So, uh, so the first five or ten steps, uh, the charge density is kept fixed at the atomic one. Wave functions are optimized, optimized, optimized a few times. And then, um, then the mixing kicks in. Yes. So why do we not do uh, a, a direct uh, diagonalization of the Hamiltonian, an exact one? Uh, because you could envision that doing that, you set up a Hamiltonian, express it in, in plane waves, um, and simply diagonalize it. And you end up with uh, a bunch of uh, eigenstates and eigenenergies. So this, bunch, so this would be a matrix uh, of the size of, of the number of uh, plane waves in our FFT grid times the number of plane waves in our FFT grid, and you diagonalize it. There's software to do this, or libraries. But you end up with n FFT eigenfunctions of your system. And you don't need so many, because this, 
For, for, for instance, imagine the, the worst possible situation that would be a small molecule in a large box. So N, N FFT might be 50,000, for instance. Uh, but you, for the small molecule, you need only four states to put the electrons in. You only want to occupy a few states. You're not interested in 50,000 eigenstates of this system. You only want four of them. Yeah, so, and diagonalization commonly scales cubically with system size, so you pay a heavy price for an exact di diagonalization of this matrix, and you have to store it. So, so you don't want to do this. And iterative diagonalization is a way around it. You can, uh, by, with, by means of iterative diagonalization techniques like Block-Davidson or RMM, you can, um, you can iteratively determine the 10 lowest eigenstates of your, of, your, of your matrix, and not all of them, right? So that is why we don't, we don't actually do, do the, uh, the exact diagonalization. OK, so yes, so that is, that is the reason that, uh, that we use all these nice methods like RMM dias or, or uh, Block Davidson. Yeah, so another key ingredient is uh, subspace diagonalization. And that's one of the things that we, uh, that we have uh, spoken about before. So the subspace is the space spanned by, by our current orbitals. So and essentially, the things that we do in, in, um, in, in iterative matrix diagonalization um, methods is uh, Rayleigh-Ritz diagonalization and uh, um, in, the, in this uh, iterative subspace. Yeah? And that is only of the size of the number of bands that we want to compute, so the, let's say of the order of the number of electrons in our, in our unit cell. Uh, times the number of bands. Yeah, so these are small diagonaliz diagonalization problems, much different in that sense from this one, which would be a huge one, right? So iterative matrix diagonalization depends on yeah, Rayleigh-Ritz diagonalization in the subspace of the current orbitals, where we have our Hamiltonian in, in this subspace, and in our case, an overlap operator and these approximate eigenenergies, right, which are the diagonal entries of, of this um, matrix that is being diagonalized. Yeah. Another key quantity is the residual that essentially tells us how far away from exact our eigenfunctions and eigenenergies are, right? Because at, at, uh, for an exact state, obviously, the residual would be zero. Uh, h psi is then is h psi is times is equal to to epsilon psi uh, for for an exact eigenstate. Yeah. So um, <coughs> yes, this is sometimes a bit complicated, but I want to give you a taste for for what happens and uh, and and mention some of the of the buzzwords uh, connected to it. So yes. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so block Davidson, what, what would you do in a block Davidson <laughs> algorithm, which is one of these iterative diagonalization methods by which we uh, compute the so and so many lowest eigenstates of our, of our eigenspectrum of, of the Hamiltonian? So, what you would do is you would take a subset of bands in block Davidson, uh, so this is the block size, and you extend this particular subset by a preconditioned residual. So the residual uh, that was this h minus epsilon working on, this, on, this, on these orbitals, and then it gets preconditioned. We can quickly forget this. But essentially, th this gives us the gradient on our orbitals. So we construct the subspace of our current orbitals and the gradient on them, and then do a, a diagonalization, a Rayleigh-Ritz diagonalization in this particular subspace. And that that gives us uh, well eigenfunctions in this subspace, and then we apply again the Hamiltonian on these eigenfunctions. That gives us another extension of our subspace, so it, it grows a bit, but it's only like, for instance, uh, you would commonly take four bands uh, and then construct, uh, then compute the gradient, and you have a subspace of the size eight, 
and then you might uh, yeah, diagonalize it and then compute the gradient again on those orbitals, then you're at size 12. And so the basis in which we do this diagonalization is growing, but it's, it's very, very small. So it's not, it's not a really a, a big problem. So um, after a few of those steps uh, where, where the space is growing, and those spaces are commonly called Krilov spaces. So I don't know if you, if you ever come across this. This is a Krilov method. So um, yeah, this, uh, as your search space is continuously, uh, as you add h psi to your search space, uh, you come closer to these to this eigenfunctions. So after a few steps, and commonly we don't do more than three or four, um, you take this, this uh, optimized set and replace this, this bunch of bands that, uh, that you were optimizing with this, with this set. Uh, and then you move on to the next block, and at the end, uh, in essence, the only thing that, that remains to do uh, in the end is an orthogonalization of all these functions with respect to each other. So that is, that is how block Davidson would work and how you would approach uh, with each, each of this. As you are increasing your, your, your Krilov uh, space, the di diagonalization that you do comes closer to the exact eigenfunction of, uh, of one end of the spectrum. Depending on how you, how you set this up, you can, you can uh, get the lowest eigenvalues of your eigenspectrum or the highest ones. But w we obviously use it to, to get at the lowest so many eigenfunctions and eigenenergies of our, of our Hamiltonian. And that is obviously still, the Hamiltonian here is still at constant density. So you do a few steps of this iterative refinement and then an orthogonalization, and then you compute a new density and mix that one, and then it goes back into this, into this guy. So that is essentially how the self-consistency uh, cycle works. So, and in the density there we said, okay, we don't want to use the, uh, the, the complete new density because then the whole thing will become unstable. Um, and I don't want to really go too much into this, but what is essentially, um, what is essentially done in, uh, in programs like VASP, programs like VASP and other programs use this as well. They use Broiden mixing. And Broiden mixing um, uses a constructs a model for the dielectric function. So the dielectric function tells you how strongly will my potential change if I change my density a bit. So knowing this would obviously help you to dampen out uh, huge variations right? that, you, that you wouldn't want. Of course, as, as soon as you have computed your ground state, you could compute the dielectric function and you would know it, but you wouldn't know it beforehand. So, so Broiden mixers will start with an approximation to the dielectric function, and that is, uh, that, that is uh, well, these parameters that one can set for the mixing. They uh, use an approximation for the dielectric function, and with every step, the, the, the mixer learns something about this response and starts to refine this model. So as you are mixing, it becomes more uh, clever at, at mixing and getting rid of, uh, rid of, of huge responses. Um, at some point, uh, the mixer will, well, it stores information for this and, it, and that is expensive to carry around indefinitely. So at some point, the mixer will get reset. And that is why you might sometimes see that all of a sudden your convergence behavior worsens again because then the mixer uh, gets reset. Yes, anyway, that, that is uh, in, in a nutshell what, what, Broiden mixer, what the Broiden mixer uh, will try to do. And uh, these, these parameters that sort of give you the, uh, the shape of your dielectric function, they are, well, there's defaults for them, um, but they would not work equally well always. I mean, they, they, the defaults are chosen such, such that it works well in many, many cases. But that is one of the things that you might, uh, might want to try to play with um, um, when you see that your, your, your system is not converging as rapidly as you would, uh, would like, yeah? or not converging at all, mostly. Well, where, where does this be pose a problem? Um, there's, for instance, in magnetic systems, we often see this. The mixer is learning about, your, about the response of your system, but the first part of, of, of the strongest response of your system is the electrostatic response. So it's constructing a mixing function that is very good at, at, uh, at predicting uh, which new charge density to choose with respect to electrostatic interactions. 
but the, the, the relaxational modes of the magnetic system, they are, they are of, an, of a completely different order <coughs> of magnitude in the total energy. So this function that, is getting, that gets constructed uh, will, not be, uh, will not be very effic effective at mixing the magnetization density. So if you, if you do magnetic systems, it might help to do like 20 steps um, of self-consistency and then stop the calculation after 20 steps and restart it. You will restart with a fresh mixer that will, be, that will be much, for that particular mixer, the magnetic modes will be much more visible at the beginning because the responses at that point will be more strongly dominated by magnetic modes, for instance. So it's some, some of those things. Um, yes, and then there's horrible systems that will simply refuse to, to uh, converge. Yeah. It's, one has to play with it. Good, that was the end of this particular talk. Any questions before, let's, let's do a few questions, uh, if, if any, before we, before we break, right? Yes? So you show the difference between the uh, direct minimization and there is a self-consistent minimization approach, right? And then you show there saying it's the order diamond, uh, di diamond timer and it's all the FCC so I'm a little bit confused. What do you mean that disorder? Because they are all pure. Slightly perturbed. So I mean, I don't, it, in this, so there are longish cells. Uh, uh, and you see here that, that you see there's sort of the, the atomic positions have been slightly perturbed. And then in this case, you're trying to get one uh, uh, ionic relaxation, this process. The, the, this exactly well. So so the so the positions are kept like, yeah. like fixed, yeah. and this is the electronic uh, convergence. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so in one side you have a table of comparison of the PW meter with the oil commensor. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some elemental uh, material that PW doesn't have a good job. Something like uh, that LU, the third column. Last line of a 3.5 mm discrepancy. Ah, yes. So lutetium. Like yes. Chromium. Yeah, lutetium is. Um, yes, and that is most probably. So that is where the where the the uh, the actinides start, right? No, sorry, the lanthanides. Lutetium. Okay. Yes. So there. Um, Notoriously difficult, but even worse, there's only, um, a, a, well, not the most effort went into creating those pseudopotentials. So, um, because they're not so commonly used, so, so there's, there's like, the, these, these PAW data sets, they have grown organically. So the ones that are, that are used very, very often are, are of the highest quality uh, in most cases. So I guess that this was an old calculation actually by, by Kurt because normally Georg, when he sees numbers like this, he starts to uh, work on the, on the potential. Um, one should, as a side issue, one should, uh, one should be aware of the fact that um, this delta value, so it looks like well, most of them are very small, but a delta value of two is already almost perfect agreement. So three and a half is definitely something where you, where you might look, but it's not a, a, a red light, yeah? So of course, in these kind of studies, uh, it then becomes sort of the, the game that everybody tries to approach zero as best as possible. Uh, but I mean, everything uh, from two and, and below is, is almost perfect agreement, so yes. Yeah? Oh, sorry. Have there been studies that um, uh, compare the experimental determined charge densities with gas charge densities? Um, well, there, well there, there, there are people that do this, obviously, with crystallographics. Um, and they would use mostly beta analysis and then compare compare spectra that came come out of this. So they decompose the, the beta charges uh, 
on the atoms and, and compare this to, uh, to diffractional experiments that, that I know of. <coughs> yes, so yeah. I don't know how, how well this is, th this, how well that compares, but. It, judging by the table, it seems like they should compare well. I mean. Yeah, but the thing is that this is DFT against DFT. Right, and as soon as you say experiment, then then things change. I mean, this this should essentially here you would expect if everybody does their job, this should be zero, sort of, right? And com and DFT compared to experiment or hybrid functional or what have you not, there will always be a difference. Yes, so so there it would would not necessarily mean that that something is bad. It's simply that that your approximation is limited, right? Yeah. So we have a number of questions from online yeah. participants, uh, including a few from this morning's session. I'll start with the more recent mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of a crystal, why do you only need the lowest 10 eigenfunctions? In the case of a, well, uh, well, 10 was just, 10 was, so in the case of a crystal, why do I only need the uh, 10 lowest eigenfunctions? Um, well, 10 was just, uh, just some number that I, that I, that I, uh, that I came up with. Um, that, I mean, you don't need 10 eigenfunctions always, but what you need is you need enough. Um, sorry, why don't I find this now? Yes, so. So what, what we need is we need enough functions to be able to represent the <coughs> density, right? Yeah, so, uh, so the density is constructed, well here it's the sum over this n, uh, the number of uh, bands. Um, and in each of these, uh, of these uh, one electron orbitals, we can put either one electron or two, depending on, on whether we, uh, we consider spin polarization or not, yeah? So let's, let's forget about spin polarization. Then for each of these orbitals, uh, in each of these orbitals, we can put two electrons. So if I have a unit cell uh, which contains uh, 50 electrons, I, I would need 25 orbitals to be able to put them in, and then I can compute the density. So in that sense, we only need a limited number of the lowest uh, eigenstates. <laughs> Uh, because if we look at our total energy e expressions, uh, we see that the total that they. Um, I don't know if I have that one, but essentially, you can compute the total energy as a sum over the. Of, well, it's not it's not this expression. Sorry, but you can compute the uh, represent the total energy as a sum over the eigen energies. So you would, if you would uh, fill your states with electrons, you would fill the lowest ones first because that would end up with the lowest total energy, right? So, yes. So in that sense, uh, we only need a limited one, and we need the, uh, a limited number of the lowest eigenstates of our of our Hamiltonian. Yeah. Right. Case by case, how transferable are different types of pseudo potentials for specific types of calculations? Right. So that that is uh, that is a, a very good question. That that and that gets asked. Uh, um, so actually, it gets asked so often that we should probably make it more prominent in the manual. <laughs> um, yes, the transferability of the of the potentials would actually mean that it would not. It, it's not so important that you use a potential that is constructed um, with the functional that you are actually going to use. The transferability of the thing should be enough that that should not really matter. <coughs> so I should be able to do a, an LDA calculation with a PBE potential um, 
or uh, and that is ex exactly what happens or do a hybrid functional calculation with a PBE potential because we do not generate uh, potentials that are used in hybrid functionals with hybrid functionals right so we can so there you are forced actually to use uh, either an LDA or a PBE and it should uh, it should not matter a lot the potential should be transferable enough that it should uh, be able to deal with this um, so the fact that we have different versions is sort of a historical thing and it's limited to the fact that we can generate these potentials only for LDA and for PBE and I think for a revised PBE something that does not get done anymore uh, even so we do still uh, generate them for LDA and for PBE for a long time we were doing uh, GW calculations with LDA potentials because they were only generated for for uh, for LDA now that has been taken care of you can use PBE ones there um, I standardly use PBE potentials unless I do an actual LDA calculation there I might use the one that has been generated with LDA because I have it not because I think it is so important but since I have it I would use it um, the difference between then there's differences between the potentials uh, and so not related per se to the functional with which they were generated so there's always these well not always but there's versions that are called underscore H uh, that are harder ones those uh, generally have a smaller core radius so if you have for instance um, some bonding situations with extremely short bonds then uh, there might be uh, th it might be that you would need a harder potential eh, with a smaller uh, pseudo potential core so that those cores do not overlap so strongly so typical situations are uh, oxygen dimer for instance so there is an O a potential and an oxygen underscore H potential so if you're in some situation where you have very short bonds between nitrogen and oxygen or, or what have you not you would need to use a harder potential with a smaller core harder because as soon as the core becomes smaller you would due to all kinds of, of reasons need more plane waves to, to represent the, the resulting uh, pseudo wave function Yes, <laughs> it is mostly the size of, of the core. Um, the GW potentials, and that will come up in another talk, they are a bit different. Um, they're, they're, um, the size of the one center basis has been increased. So we have uh, looked at, and I will, I will make this point uh, again, but we can quickly go to it now. Um, sorry. Where is it? Yes, so um, eh? I've mentioned this before that we represent the scattering properties of the atom over a certain range of energies. Um, normally it is sufficient that this range of energies spans, ener spans energies that are close to the, to the bound states of the valence. Uh, of course the eigenenergies in a chemical bonded situation will be different but if, if it's over a range close to the valence it's enough um, for these methods that are now becoming en vogue like GW where we need part of the unoccupied spectrum you would need to represent the scattering properties also high up uh, away from the from the occupied states and there is potentials where there has been extra taken care of the fact that scattering properties are uh, are truly represented up to a much higher energy within the spectrum and those are those underscore GW potentials they're slightly more um, expensive because the one center basis is larger maybe slightly harder but not necessarily so um, so you could use them for ground state calculations as well so but for, for as if you are interested in uh, lots of unoccupied states for whatever reason then um, those are the kind of potentials one one should use. So a couple more questions around pseudo potentials. Yep. Uh, how would you go about visualizing or plotting the pseudo potential itself? Ah, uh, yeah. The pseudo so okay. Uh -huh. So so common quantities that one that one would plot 
in connection with pseudo potentials or that or their generation would be such a thing but i take it that that is not necessarily what what is meant here but yes so we have all kinds of horrible scripts that do this <laughs> 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 but, but yeah uh, and somebody else asks what does a pseudo potential for hydrogen mean since there are no core electrons in nature a core just a core yeah Yes. Uh, yes, something, something other than a 1 over r core, obviously. So we have several more questions online that might throw to the room. Yep. Yes, cool. Can you stand up to us? In the diagonalization, do we uh, use also uh, symmetry adaptation? Uh, no, no, the, the, um, the only, so in the diagonalization, where does symmetry enter there? The, the symmetry enters due to the fact that we have reduced the set of uh, Bloch wave vectors by symmetry. So symmetry enters, of course, in setting up the Hamiltonian because we must symmetrize our charge density before we construct the Hamiltonian out of it. Um, and then the, the number of, of Bloch wave vectors uh, for which we have to uh, solve this is reduced by, by symmetry. Uh, because this problem essentially, um, so that is, not, that is not necessarily expressed very clearly uh, on the slides, unfortunately. But um, if we do the action of the Hamiltonian on a wave function, uh, uh, or, or compute its, uh, its expectation value, the Bloch wave vector of this, uh, of this entity and the one we use on the other side is the same. It is diagonal in, in reciprocal space, right? So they only couple through the density. Unless you use hybrid functions where things are different, but uh, you compute the total density, there's a sum over, over the k vectors, but then in essence, uh, computing Hamiltonian elements is uh, diagonal in reciprocal space. So the, the effort uh, scales linearly with the number of, of uh, k points that, that I have in my reciprocal space sampling. But so for each k block, k block, there is more symmetry adaptation? No, 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 because in essence plane waves, don't, well you could construct stars out of them uh, Oh, but there's no need, no real need to do that here. Yeah, it is done obviously in in uh, in the step where we symmetrize the charge density, because symmetrization of the charge density is done in reciprocal space, and there you would construct these uh, stars out of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. You show some comparisons with Gaussian codes. How do, you, how do you make sure that the basis sets are comparable? Is that infinite basis at the limit? Yes. Oh, okay. um, actually, in this comparison, I don't know. I have another one. Um, I mean, uh, yes, but in essence, that, that is done. Or we simply, uh, we simply crank up the basis set at, as, as much as possible, which for the small molecules yeah. is still possible, right? Uh, there you would not have to extrapolate per se, um, but yes. So that, that we have done this, for instance, and that was a nice one for a chlorine dimer. Uh, and then it turns out that that uh, well, I, it's on one of the other slides that that, that you will get to see uh, that you, you have to go to a huge basis set and and use a sufficient uh, number of plane waves on the same time, and then you see that the results agree, but only if you crank up both methods uh, uh, completely. Is it so important? Um, I mean, yeah, if you want to go to, to agreement of one kcal per mole, it is important. For many situations, it would probably not be so important that you would use a, a smaller basis set for it. I don't know. I, I don't know Gaussian, Gaussian uh, well enough to be able to say for this you should use that or for this. But I think that that is pretty well known and pretty well characterized. Especially because this G21 test set uh, was obviously chosen because it's one of the Popol's uh, sets, right? Of, yeah. So a few more from online. Uh, 
respect to potentials, how do you decide which potential to use? Um, there is, we have a recommendation on, on the website in the manual. So I would start with the recommended ones. Um, if then, for instance, uh, yes, for GW, I would use the recommended GW one. Um, and then it, it, there's no, there's nothing that one can, there's no guarantees. Let's put it like this, right? So, so if you if you have the feeling that uh, that uh, that maybe uh, that it would maybe pay off in this part in this part for this particular compound that you're studying, it would pay off to include more electrons in the valence. You might look whether there's a potential uh, that includes a, a part of the core into the valence. There's all kinds of these varieties. Um, yeah, because any recommendation is only a general one, and uh, and the particulars of, of where where people use it, uh, we cannot predict beforehand. So one one always has to test. And yeah. Uh, it might be a related question. Um, how does one treat rare earth systems that have um, open boring shells? Yes, that that is. Uh, so if you are lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky, then you can put the four Fs in the core. So if they're strongly localized and they're, they're, they do not contribute to the binding, then, then there's v varieties uh, of, of uh, potentials that are sort of ionic potentials. You put, uh, you put the, the four Fs into the core, and that would be very good, for instance, for three plus rare earths in, in, in ionic systems or something like that. As soon as, for F, uh, if, as soon as the F electrons start to build bands, or if you have a metallic states, and then you would have to include them in the valence and, uh, and, and, and hope for the best. I mean, it's, the problem is that those electrons, they're, they're often um, they're often strongly localized, and then it's not, it's not so much a problem of, of, the, of the PAW method, actually. The PAW method can deal with this, but it's DFT. So DFT is not good for these, for these strongly localized states. It, wa it wants to delocalize them uh, uh, too strongly, density functional theory, or most density functionals, let's put it more specifically. And, uh, and then it might, it might end up that your calculation has, has not a lot to do with, with the physics, with the physical reality, right? So, yes, they're notoriously problematic systems. Uh, so are there any utility code available to kind of convert between the PAW and EPF format, uh, that universal potential format? No. Because uh, I have need our uh, PWSC as the alpha format. I know, format, so. yeah. I know, I know that, that yes, that I, was, I was present at a workshop where, where they discussed uh, this. Um, interest from our side to do this is limited by the fact that we sell our stuff. Uh, and, and so, yes, is, is that a good thing? I don't know. Um, it, it's, it's good for us in the sense that, that it allows us to maintain the code. Um, would it be nice to use other potentials? I don't think there's a real need. I mean, the study has shown that, uh, that, that there's a few good sets of potentials out there that one can use, and, and we, are, we are among them. So I don't know whether, what, what the need would be to, to use uh, another one. But direct comparison between our code and, and another one is not so much in our interest, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, but that, uh, that followed up with the discussion when you said yeah. that you know, one can, in principle, put the 4F electron if they're localizing the core. So there could be some kind of uh, 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 capability in designing the suitable potential would be helpful. Or can we actually... Yes, oh, yeah, okay. Well, that is, that is one thing uh, which, I, which I should probably explicitly mention. So there, there are pseudo-potentials that, where that stuff has been put into the core. Th those are available. If you have particular needs, um, then, then I really suggest you rely on Georg Kresse to construct the potential. Um, we don't distribute the software to construct the potentials with, not because uh, we think that, that um, we don't think it's, it's wise, actually. I mean, construction of pseudo-potentials 
um, unless you really know what you are doing, uh, it, is, it, it is where sort of the magic happens. This is still a sort of alchemy. You turn a bit here, you turn a bit here, and it's a, a huge parameter space. And people's brains w connected with experience can find a way through this parameter space. If you don't know what you're doing, it's very, very easy to make uh, a bad potential. So we don't actually encourage this at all. I would not try my hand at it. And I'm already in, in this field for a very long time. If I need something, I go to one room and say, please, can you make or can you make this ghost state disappear? Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Um, so tinkering with it would not would lead to many many problems. I have. To, I, I have. To, is my impression. So a few, I guess, operational questions. Okay. Um, earlier this morning, you were talking about aliasing errors. So if I perform the calculation, how can I tell either? either afterwards or before the fact, whether or not that calculation has aliasing problems. Right. Um, so, well, first of all, uh, VASP will tell you this, whether there is aliasing present in the current choice of grids. Um, if, however, you choose your grids such, if the grids are chosen such that the grid, uh, which is commonly called, yeah, the Unfortunately, nothing to write on. Um, really? Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> if my mother would see this. <laughs> yeah, so there's a quantity that is called NGX or Y or Z. And there's one, and it's in the outcore file. And there's one that is called NGXF, YF, YZ. So is, if this one is two times this one, then the grid used to represent the charge density uh, should be free of aliasing. Well, it should be at least two times that one. So that, that would be, but if you set, if you set this <coughs> precision is A or precision is accurate, you know, would only sensitive to the first uh, to the first character. If you set precision to accurate, uh, you're guaranteed to be free of aliasing in the representation of the charge density. Yeah. Okay, I think it's about time. We can defer some yeah online questions. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool.